You remember Tin Ben Boo? No! The same thing happened in Algeria, in Africa. They didn't have anything but a rank. The French had all these highly mechanized instruments of warfare. But they put some guerrilla action on them. Hello and welcome to Guerrilla History, the podcast that acts as a reconnaissance report of global proletarian history and aims to use the lessons of history to analyze the present. I'm your host, Henry Huckamaki, joined by my co-hosts, Professor Adnan Hussein, historian and director of the School of Religion at Queen's University in Ontario, Canada. Hello, Adnan. Hi, Henry. Uh, and Brett O'Shea, host of Revolutionary Left Radio and co-host of the Red Menace podcast. Hello, Brett. Hello, Henry. Nice to have you both here. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we're going to have coming up. So today our guest is Vijay Prashad, who is the director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, is the author of many books, including uh, The Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World, The Poorer Nations, A, a Possible History of the Global South, and Red Star, Red Star Over the Third World. But Today, he's going to be gracious enough to talk about his newest book, which is just out. It's called Washington Bullets. It's out from Left Word Books. That's Left, W-O-R-D, Books. Um, and it talks about the history of U.S. intervention, CIA coups, and, and the like uh, across the world. And what I think was a really, really interesting and thought-provoking book. So before VJ comes on, let's uh, talk about our general thoughts of the book some of the things that we thought were particularly interesting and some of the questions that it, it kind of raised for us. And then we'll bring Vijay on and, and we'll, we'll have a conversation with him about um, his, his book, Washington Bullets. So uh, Brett, uh, Adnan, what, are, what, what were your thoughts on Washington Bullets, Brett? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and start this off. Um, I, I love the book. Um, obviously, it's a sort of broad overview of the, the patterns of, of American imperialism. Um, touching on a bunch of different stuff without getting lost in the details of any one specific event. Um, one thing that really comes through and something that I really like to reiterate is that you have to, it really helps to understand the CIA as the organized crime branch of the American ruling class. Their job is to go about the world, not to promote freedom and democracy like American ideology and, and American ideologues like to pretend that American governments do, but actually as a force of evil, as a force of anti-democracy in the world, all in the name ultimately of multinational corporations and their profits, which own the American government. So understanding the CIA, not as just a intelligence agency with some good and bad things, but really as the organized crime branch of the American ruling class, I think is, is essential here. And another thing I thought about when I was reading through this book, which you know occurs to me often, is it's funny in the American context when you have American patriots, American nationalists. And I've noticed a, a relationship where the more of a patriot someone is in the U.S., the less they actually know about American history, the more of like a childlike, naive, middle school level and idealist conception of American history that they tend to have. And if you do, in those extremely rare cases, come across somebody who is, f truly understands American history with real clarity and still supports it, you're talking almost entirely to a fascist and an imperialist. The history of America is, is truly a brutal one. And, uh, you know, we're just going to drive that point home today, I think. Well, this was a very interesting and readable book. In a short period of time, uh, he manages to cover uh, the patterns, really, as Brett was saying, of U.S. imperial intervention. But one thing that I really liked about the book was how it grounded his analysis in a period even before the U.S. becomes the predominating global superpower in the post-World War II period to set up the way in which colonialism and imperialism of an earlier era set up uh, some of the structures that really inform uh, how the world is organized today and a lot of the views and ideas about the dangers of colonial peoples seeking their democratic and economic rights has been and how that continued under the U.S. with new forms and patterns where the U.S. really sort of perfected the way of intervening um, in this new new uh, global uh, order post-World War II. 
I think it's also a terrific companion to a book you mentioned that was very important and influential when it came out, uh, The Darker Nations. Uh, That book really went through a lot of the history of the Third World movements, um, anti-imperialism, and talked about a lot of these histories. And what we're getting in this book, it seems to me, is a lot of the analysis about how and why and the patterns of intervention of how those movements, anti-imperial, uh, anti-colonial, anti-capitalist movements were derailed and have been by uh, U.S. intervention. Uh, So it's a really good companion piece, I think, to the darker nations. Yeah, I I agree with both of you. And one thing I want to highlight is what Adnan just said about readability. The readability of this book is extremely high. I think that this is a book that anybody can take and really take a lot from. It's written in a way that it focuses on highlights without getting lost in flowery language or getting too deep into any specific event. It really is a a good through line of the history of U.S. intervention abroad without getting too mired down in either language or or details because there is so much that you could cover. And of course, a lot of authors like to write in very flowery prose, but VJ here does an excellent job of just presenting things to you in a way that really makes you learn new things, uh, find new events and really think about how these things work. And, and, uh, another thing that I think was really interesting is that as Adnan also said, it looks at before the U S was the predominant power in the world, or as he says many times before, they had preponderant power in the world and almost tracks us back to the foundation of America as, as a nation back in 1776, but especially since the Monroe Doctrine. And you really get this through line and you see the changes in methodology that the U.S. as a state used over time to intervene in these foreign lands. Uh, one of the through lines that you see in this methodology is it goes from tanks to banks to NGOs to lawfare. And the U.S. kind of has adapted its methodology over time because some of the methods that they used to that they used to do, either they found were ineffective or became ineffective over time because these uh, nations that they were trying to intervene in became wise to the methods that the U.S. were using. And the U.S. had to Uh, adapt its methodology in order to exert the same sort of influence that it had previously. So this book really did an excellent job of of showing this transition of methodology in a way that was understandable for everyone. Adnan? I think this was also, this is a really good book uh, for inaugurating the podcast in some ways because it does cover a lot of ground. Um, and because it is meant to really revive a sense of histories that have been suppressed, uh, something I'd like to hear him talk a little bit further about are the methods and approaches to really digging up this history from the sorts of sources that you have to. But I think he said something really uh, valuable that characterizes the project of the book that I think is really the project also of our conversation with him and of this podcast. He says, on page 53, militant struggle, uh, uh, about the militant struggle of the tricontinental, democracy in Portugal and in South Africa was taken by the gun. It was not given by liberalism. Those narratives are now submerged. It has to be revived. Not just the sounds of the battlefield, but also the stories of the doctors and the technicians of the revolutionary educational programs in Mozambique and Uh, Cape Verde, the attempt to build a new society out of the detritus of the colonial order. This was the revolutionary energy that is now forgotten. And that's why we need these sorts of histories um, to revive a sense of those stories that have been suppressed. And that's, I think, also the project of this podcast, uh, Guerrilla History. Yeah. And uh, just to add one quick thing on there. So I had a note from basically the same segment as you Um, And this, again, is the understanding of guerrilla history and understanding that events aren't static or monolithic. So you mentioned these these struggles uh, in these former Portuguese territories. One of the things that I thought was really interesting that he pointed out and that I wasn't quite aware of and and a lot of us wouldn't be aware of is that for a long time, the struggles in Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde were nonviolent. The 
PAIGC had nonviolent movements to try to decolonialize themselves from Portugal. But because of massacres uh, of villagers, because of massacres of dock workers, etc., by Portugal, that was what forced the armed struggle. But if you look at just history text writ large, they would focus on the armed struggle is what overthrew the Portuguese colonization of these areas, not understanding that there was uh, a transition there, that it wasn't just people overnight took up arms. There really was this, this being pushed uh, by the Portuguese. And I think that understanding things like this are really important to understanding the history um, more wholly. Brett, let's pitch it over to you. Was there anything in here that really caught you uh, that you know you weren't aware of, or something that really raised some questions that you're that you're planning on asking VJ when we bring him on? Well, I did want to mention that the the whole um, you know, sort of pattern of of U.S. imperialism, the way it rose to superpower status and the way it evolved over time, which I think um, both of you have alluded to so far, really speaks to the nature of this whole thing being a historical process of counter revolution around the globe. Um, it's very interesting to see how he talks about, and maybe we'll get into the interview that although we think of the Cold War period as this East and West sort of contradiction, um, he really he really flips that around and says it's actually a global North versus global South contradiction. Um, and, and a lot of these this Cold War battles, they obviously didn't happen with the U.S. taking on the USSR head on. They were through proxy battles, often in the global South. Um, it also speaks to the heroic nature of so many just regular people around the world who, you know, exhausted every effort they could just to have basic rights, basic say over their own life, basic control over their own res- uh, their own resources, and just how brutally and unforgiving um, the U.S. government and its allies treat these people around the world. And um, one thing that's always been close to my heart and one thing I hope maybe even guerrilla history can touch on in the future is the, the, the dropping of the atomic bombs on Japan. Um, just, and, you know, he just, he mentions it and, and he talks about it in the aftermath and, and it's fascinating, but to drill down on just how unprecedented that was, just how monstrous, um, that act was just how unnecessary it really was. He touches on this fact that Japan was already on the ropes. They were, they were already about to, uh, really give up and not one, but two of these bombs. And they were just wholeheartedly aimed at, at city centers. And of course the history of world war two has plenty of that, but I find that act of barbarism particularly striking and really as this opening salvo of what we now know as the Cold War. This really, we really have to think about that dropping of the atomic bombs as um, the U.S. flexing to the Soviet Union and saying, now that World War II is coming to an end, like you're you're the enemy. And uh, things like Operation Paperclip, where the U.S. extracted a bunch of Nazi intellectuals and scientists to start their war effort against the Soviet Union. Um, I think all that history is fascinating and really deserves its own sort of deep dive at, at some point. Yeah, so... One of the things that you touched on, I think, is something else that we're going to want to bring up. So you talk about Operation Paperclip and extracting Nazis. And, you know, there was something else that I was completely unaware of is how religious institutions were doing essentially the same thing, where they were extracting Nazis from Germany after World War II and bringing them to various places, uh, you know, harboring them and allowing them to take a foothold in in other places, particularly in Latin America. Uh, But yeah, I, I just also want to emphasize what Brett said, um, that this thinking of the Cold War is not really being a Cold War East-West, U.S., USSR, but rather a global North, global South colonialism uh, colonialism versus decolonialism or anti-colonialism was really something that, you know, caught me. I guess it shouldn't have caught me by surprise, but something that really was uh, eye-opening for me. Adnan, I'll let you have more or less the last word before we bring in Vijay. so uh, anything else that you want to raise uh, in our introduction for uh, before VJ comes on? Well, it's a it's a book with so many different uh, dimensions and aspects. Um, we could ask him about many, many things. I think I'll be interested. You alluded to uh, religious institutions. I think um, in this book, he also talks about liberation theology as a counter uh, force, a religious movement that was... Uh, on the side of people and also had to be suppressed in various ways. And I think that's an interesting topic to broaden out is the ways in which um, religious movements, uh, you know, worked on both sides uh, of this. Um, But also just fundamentally, 
Um, he concludes uh, the book. Um, it's a little bit dark, you know, we, this, this story of all of the Washington bullets, uh, all of the ways in which um, U.S. imperialism has derailed movements around the world for liberation and social justice. And so I just wondered at the end, maybe um, if he had any thoughts, I would like to ask him about uh, not just necessarily naive or vain hope, but whether or not the rebalancing of the world, um, now that the United States may not be such a predominating power, even if militarily it's very strong, um, if there is a rebalancing of the world that might provide opportunities and options for future revolutionary and liberatory struggles around the world. Absolutely. So uh, I think that we're all in agreement that the book was absolutely worth our while to, to read. It was a very fast read and very eye-opening. And, and I think that uh, I can safely say that we're, we're all recommending that the listeners, uh, everyone, uh, go look into grabbing the Washington bullets or Washington bullets. Um, you're not going to regret it. And just final thing before we bring in VJ, um, the mention of liberation theology, I, I believe it was the second to the second newest episode of uh, Brett's Rev Left Radio uh, had an episode on liberation theology, a, a pretty deep dive into it. So uh, if you're listening to this and you haven't yet listened to uh, Brett's Rev Left Radio episode on liberation theology, give give that a look because that was an excellent episode. And I think that uh, having people cross pollinate between these shows really will give them a deeper understanding because of course, an episode on that specifically is going to be far more in depth than anything that we're going to be able to cover with VJ um, on liberation theology coming up. So give that a listen and we'll be right back with VJ Prashad. Welcome back to Guerrilla History. We're now joined by our very, very special and inaugural guest, Vijay Prashad, director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. As I mentioned before in the introduction, Vijay is the author of many, many books, something like three books at this point, um, including some really important works like The Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World, The Poorer Nations, A Possible History of the Global South, and Red Star Over the Third World. But Today, VJ is going to be talking to us about his newest book, which we've already introduced, um, Washington Bullets, which is now out from Left Word Books. That's W-O-R-D, Left Word Books. And uh, VJ, I guess to get us into it, I'm going to mention the fact that Washington Bullets' preface was written by uh, none other than Evo Morales. And at the time of recording, we're now uh, just a couple days divorced from Moss uh, being victorious at the polls in Bolivia. So um, I know that we're going to get back to Bolivia, you know, by the end of the conversation. But uh, do you have anything that you want to get out there uh, early on? And how did you get Evo Morales to write the preface to the book? Well, uh, it's great to be with you. And, I, you know, I like the idea of a gorilla podcast. Uh, it's super. Uh, it brings back all kinds of uh, emotions and evocations. You know, uh, it evokes our rear guard action to bring good ideas um, to good people and make more people good people, really, to make the majority good people. It's not easy being good in this world. And I think... Um, Part of, I think, the task of, of intellectual activity is to try to expand um, this sense that it's possible to be good and it's possible to be a decent person. You know, that's part of our task, I think. And uh, this brings me directly to the fact that there was a coup against um, the government of Evo Morales Aima in November, uh, well, beginning in October of 2019 and then in November. Um, during that period, Lots of people, not only um, in uh, Latin America, but worse, uh, in the overseas, particularly Western left, lots of people felt that this was not a coup. And they felt that um, Evo Morales had made lots of mistakes and therefore somehow deserved what was happening to him. Uh, I was surprised to read so-called think pieces written on websites of, you know, what purports to be left periodicals, and there's no need to mention them. They know who they are. Um, you know, making the kinds of gestures that suggested um, that they would be happy to be weaponized by the CIA 
against the uh, movement of the people in Bolivia, which is the movement to socialism, which was in government and whose term was not going to expire till January of 2020. And yet when Evo Morales was removed from office in November 2019 by a military action, um, even liberals who, constitutional liberals, who should have said, look, he should be allowed to serve out his term till January, you know, even if the election of October 2019 is in doubt, that was not, it was not based on that election that his term went till January. But even constitutional liberals and people of the so-called left started saying, well, you know, it's good. There was fraud in the election, they said, believing the organization of American states. And that really struck me as, as peculiar and disturbing. And I decided that, um, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to now, um, apart from all the other things I do, I'm not going to go to bed for the next three weeks and I'm going to write this book. And I literally wrote this book in a feverish pace. Um, you know, I, I have, you know, great fond memories of Eduardo Galliano. And I remember very well Galliano saying that there are times when it's our job just to do things. You know, uh, don't, you know, you thinking at that moment, um, I'm angry at what's happening. People don't understand the history of how coups happen. They don't understand what the OAS is. They don't understand the CIA. Or maybe they're being deliberately opaque about their knowledge, you know. Uh, but Galliano, I remember, said many times, sometimes you just have to say it again, you know, like his books on torture. You just have to say it again. It's not like entire generations don't know what the junta did in Argentina and Uruguay and Chile and B Brazil. And yet Eduardo went and wrote brilliant books over and over again because you just have to do it. And I said to myself, you know, you just got to do it. And I sat down and I just wrote this book at a fever pitch. And I said, I'm writing it for young militants because we need armor. We cannot afford to have amnesia against, you know, 60, 70 years of, of the, you know, the history of the CIA and what they've done, um, what the CIA has done, you know, not, not like one person here and one person there, this institution which continues to exist, what this institution has done. It has to be there. Now, of course, there are a million books in the library. Of course, there are many, many synthetic accounts sitting somewhere or the other. That doesn't matter. What did Galliano say? You just got to do it. You got to say it again and again and again, because the battle of ideas is adverse. We, we haven't made the point, you know. And so many of these books are 500 pages long because the crimes of the CIA are so significant. So I said, I'm going to write a 100-page book which is going to tell the whole story. I'm somehow going to do this. In 100 pages, I'm going to just indict the CIA from its founding till the present. And, you know, I'm going to tell you, in a month and a bit, I had a draft. And I said, Evo has to write the foreword to this. And he agreed because he was sitting in Argentina and had just been overthrown in a coup. And when, you know, I said, this book is called Washington Bullets because I've been waiting to write a book with that name, Washington Bullets. And I went for a walk and I had my headphones on and I was listening to music and I put it to a recording app and I basically just said to it and I, did, I haven't even edited this you know I just said what is the price of an assassin's bullet some dollars here and there the cost of the bullet the cost of a train ride a hotel an airplane I just started speaking this I, I, this is totally unedited the first part it's exactly the whole of that first paragraph was basically me pissed off talking into my phone while I was just walking and I came back and I transcribed it and I said, that's it. And when I sent it, a preface has to be done. And it was done. And if you, if you, if you see the preface, the last line of the preface from Evo Morales, he says, last two lines, we have the conviction that we are the masses and that the masses over time will win. This was written in April. Here's a man who has his finger on the pulse of his people. Yeah, excellent. So uh, I guess to get us moving into the book itself now and then that'll open up opportunities for the guys to uh yeah jump in and, and start asking questions but i, I want to just add a quote from that little section that you were talking about in regards to 
uh, Washington bullets. And you're talking about, yeah, w- what is the price of a bullet? It's not the price of the raw materials. It's not the price of production. It's the price of what was the what did it cost that bullet to the people that that bullet was used on? And, and you said, quote, in Indonesia, the price of the bullet was in the millions. In Guatemala, the tens of thousands. The death of Lumumba damaged the social dynamic of the Congo, muzzling its history. What did it cost to kill Chokri Belaid and Ruth first? What did it take to kill Amilcar Cabral and Berta Caceres? I, I mean, it's, it's amazing that we don't often think of what the cost of these actions were to the people in these areas. And we also don't understand a lot of the times that it's not necessarily as simple as a bullet. And I think that this brings us to one of the key points of your book is, is what you were calling the, the manual for regime change, which was a nine step program. And I'm just going to read out the, uh, the nine steps and then I'll, I'll have you comment on it. And the, and the guys will be able to, you know, bounce, bounce back and forth off of you. So you have your manual for regime change. One, lobby public opinion. Two, appoint the right man on the ground. Three, make sure the generals are ready. Four, make the economy scream. Five, diplomatic isolation. Six, organize mass protests. Seven, green light. Eight, a study of assassination. And nine, deny. There's this whole through line for these movements. So, Vijay, I guess I, I why am I talking? We have you on. Uh, why don't you? Why don't you comment on that? Well, you see, uh, the first thing is that it's not like I need to make up anything. And really the advantage here is that um, because the United States is, you know, a half-baked democracy, there are rules that some materials need to be made public after a certain amount of time. Plus there's, you know, the Freedom of Information Act, um, you know, opportunity available to you. With the U.S. coup against Jacob Arbenz's government in Guatemala, you actually don't even need to use the Freedom of Information Act because it's just all online. Everything is available. All the information I got on that coup, I got as PDFs from the CIA library, from the State Department library. It's all online. So I said, you know, again, Greg Grandin has written, there's so many people have written terrific books about the Guatemala coup. You know, it's all there. But what I was interested in is to use the Guatemala coup to try to create the methodology of um, the coup d'etat. What's the methodology? What are the pieces of the coup? If you just tell the narrative of the coup, it looks like, well, that's about Guatemala 53. I was not interested in the narrative of that coup, you know, the conjuncture of that coup. I was interested in the structure of regime change. And that's a theoretical concern. That's not a concern on the level of empirical. But in order to produce the theory in a credible way, you need enough empirical valid empirical information and rather than go and interview the victims whose you know whose opinions can be discarded as they often are i just took the cia's own texts and if the cia is to be believed if you look at their own text this is what they say they did then this is the methodology that they operate with. And it's not just merely in Guatemala, which is why I interspersed it. I bring in Guyana, I bring in different coups and you know, tell the story in such a way that if the reader is reading with care, then they will notice that Bolivia 2019 follows the exact script. You know, you just need to read about Guatemala and you understand Bolivia. And that's chilling because that means from 1953 to 2019, the CIA has basically been using the same manual. And it's not just the CIA. I mean, in Colombia today, in the northern part of South America, almost every day a social movement leader is killed. And, you know, you get sporadic information about this, you know, the death of the, and they're often Afro-Colombian. This leader killed, that leader killed, local leaders. And the thing is, you got to understand, if your local leader is killed, it's almost that for a generation, politics in that area is destroyed. Because it's not just the loss of that individual. Everybody else is made terrified. And they just don't want to put their head above water. You know, when you kill one person, you can terrify a community. And that's the sort of homeopathic use of, of violence by imperialism that needs to be really grasped. You know, what they did 
in Indonesia was they killed over a million people and totally dismantled the left movement in that country for generations, till today, dismantled it. In uh, the Congo, they just actually needed to kill Lumumba in public, as it were, you know, just kill him in public. And then Mobutu comes in and they killed a lot of other people. Let's not, you know, uh, be uh, imprecise about this. It's not like only one person was killed, but the death of Lumumba, just like the death of Sankara in 1987 in uh, Burkina Faso, the death of Sankara, these things had a role much beyond the death of an individual. It actually, you know, it takes, it takes decades to build up the confidence of a people to confront authority. Decades. In many societies, it takes generations to lift your head up to authority. You know, I'm talking physically, you know, in, in, you know, in, for generations, people were beaten so that they wouldn't raise their eyes to people in power. You know, I'm talking, they wouldn't look powerful people in the eye. And by the way, I'm not talking about the medieval world. I'm talking about today. I'm talking about today. I'm not talking about in, you know, countries that uh, are, you know, wherever. I'm talking even in the advanced industrial countries. You know, somebody, a janitor walks into a building. There's somebody, a banker sitting in in his glass office, the janitor doesn't make eye contact with that banker because they're afraid of that banker and whether they'll fire them, you know. So it takes decades, generations to build confidence and that one bullet, that one person taken out can set the confidence back, you know, a long time. And that's what I wanted to explain to people that, you know, and what's amazing about Bolivia in this period is that the overthrow of Morales, you know, what they did to Patricia Arce, you know, they cut her hair off, they painted her face red, they brutalized her. Do you know what? She's back as a senator. She is back as a senator. The Bolivians have given me so much complete confidence. In a way, they've completely negated the thesis that you overthrow somebody and there's confidence lost for generations. And I salute them, you know, please prove me wrong. You know, I want to be wrong because I want you so badly to be right. Adnan, you had something you wanted to say? Well, it's just very interesting. Um, One question I did have for you, um, and I'm so glad to hear you talk about the inspiring examples uh, that resistance to Washington bullets, um, you know, can can perform for us because, in some ways, it's such a depressing history, right? To to see the pattern of regime change that you identify, and it was very useful to have that crystallized through all of those examples. But then, you know, you have a sense that. They've been running this game very successfully for, you know, since World War II. What is the possibility? You began the book uh, uh, talking a little bit about how hope uh, is a very important resource uh, for resistance. But in in reading, um, you know, the stories uh, and the patterns of successfully derailing of these popular movements for justice uh, around the Third World... You know, you're left at the end just with that sense that yes, we stand for life and 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 justice. Uh, but where do we see, from your perspective, the opportunities or the possibilities for successful resistance out of the history that you've shared with us? Yeah. So you know, um, it's not an easy question to answer. Uh, because if it were easy, then then the world would be a different place. Of I mean, course. It, you know the the, I think the the thing that that gives us um, hope and and resilience perhaps it, it is reflected in a line that you will not believe it was passed by the UN General Assembly in the 1960s, in the resolution on decolonization, there's a beautiful line, which I use all over the place, and I quote it in here. The line is, the process of liberation is irresistible. Uh, That's such a great line. You know, it was in a UN resolution. It's poetic. The process of liberation is irresistible. You can't resist it. It doesn't say it's going to win. It's irresistible. And so what's important is that humans just keep coming up. I mean, it's that old anarchist song, right? Uh, you know, what's it? You can't knock me down. I keep standing. What's the hell is that song? That stupid dance number by the anarchist band. Uh, I, I get knocked down, but I get up again. You, you know, I get knocked down, but I get up again. 
you know, you just can't keep me down. And I feel like there's something quite powerful in that. And I, I, I'm not one of those that romanticizes struggle for its sake. I want to win. Mm. You know, I, I, I actually want to win. I don't want to just say, look, what's great is that we struggle. I, I think that's extraordinarily, that's a, a, you say that from a point of luxury. Uh, because there are people who can't eat and go to bed. The children go to bed at night. They want to win. They don't just want to struggle for the sake of it. They want to win. And I believe we can win. But I also believe that you can't keep us down. You know, I get knocked down, but I get up again. And there's something powerful in that. And I have to say that that just in terms of the prose, um, I was I tried my best not to write the prose so that it was from the standpoint of Langley and the CIA. I wanted very much to write the prose so that it was from the standpoint of a young kid looking out of the window saying that, aha, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to throw a rock through your, um, your military jeep. And I'm going to do that because I want you to know that right now I might not be able to overthrow your government, but soon I will. And that's the that was the mode that I was going for. That young kid, you know, he or she sitting there looking out of their window, saying, I'm going to do something now because your days are numbered. So in a way, it's sort of you're saying that this was intended as a resource for activists. This history should be a resource. In fact, it is guerrilla history. You know, it's a history that will impel the young activist to fight back and to believe and have some confidence that the the struggle can be victorious, it can be achieved. But uh, in a way, Adnan, for me personally, this has been my quest for the last 20 plus years in, in the sense that, you know, and it, you know, it shows. Um, I, I wrote a PhD, which was two volumes, enormous amount of field research, you know, reconnaissance research. Um, you know, I couldn't get that book published. It was a book about a, a, a Dalit community in northern India. And that book, by the way, is uh, circulates in that community by PDF because people find it very useful uh, in their own lives and struggles and, and, and so on. But I couldn't get that book published. And it struck me at that. And then when it was eventually published, it was attacked by all the the scholars in the academic journals. And I actually came to an understanding. It, it actually clarified something for me, which is that that's not my world, actually. Actually, it's not my world. I respect academic work enormously. You know, I, I respect it. I respect its protocols. I understand the importance of it. You know, and I, I think it must grow and develop and, and strengthen some of its protocols and people need to be serious. That's another world, though. What I was interested in is just the following proposition, that there are enormous libraries which have enormous amounts of incredible information. And then there are hundreds of millions, billions of people out there who have no access to these libraries. They don't know what's in them. And, you know, what had happened in a way to scholarship is that scholars began to write for each other. Mm -hmm. And it became like a kind of monastic religious exercise. And I thought about 20 years ago, you know what, I'm going to just my job is not that. My job is piracy. I'm going to go into the library. I'm going to read tons of stuff. And then I'm just going to open a funnel and try to funnel out as much information as I can to people. So the second book I wrote, Karma of Brown Folk, was basically written formally for people who don't have any idea about academic debates. And you know, and in fact, it puzzled people in the academy because um, how do you review a book like that? You know, it doesn't fit any protocol. It was very successful. It made my career in a way more than my the book where I spent years researching. You know, this was like a runaway bestseller. And that's not what motivated me, though. What motivated me was going there. And so for the last 20 years, I've written, you know, you say you've written 30 books. Well, you know, it's not exactly like an academics book. I mean, Washington Bullets is 100 pages long. You know, there's an enormous amount of reading in each of these. I grant you, Red Star with the Third World is 130 pages long. Huge amount of reading. But I, I just want to take everything I learned, like that annoying person who's just finished reading a book and then comes out and wants to tell you everything they read. I want my books to be a little bit like that annoying person who's just read a book that's fascinating, 500-page book about, you know, World War II in China, and they just want to come and tell you everything. 
but they want to tell you everything in an hour. <laughs> I don't find that annoying at all, by the way, VJ. So keep doing what you're doing. Uh, Brett, what, what, what do you want to add to this? Yeah, just to take the conversation forward a little bit, um, I, I really want to sort of think about the importance of, of mass support with a lot of these things and the process of education. Because when you look at places like Venezuela, Bolivia, Cuba specifically, we see that there's mass support and we see that the people themselves are because of their experiences and their leaders have been very educated on the machinations of Western imperialism, how it operates, and that allows them to more effectively fight back. You can think of the Bay of Pigs, and you can think of these recent coup attempts in Venezuela and Bolivia that in large part were beaten back because of that mass support of the people. So I was hoping that you can kind of talk about the importance of that and just the way that manifests in different contexts. You know, some of this is a learning experience because when the Guatemala coup was happening in 53, it turned out that, uh, you know, Che Guevara was there um, in 54, sorry, Che Guevara was there in Guatemala City and he experienced what was going on and, and he writes that he was frustrated that the government didn't arm the people, didn't you know, arm their main support base and so on. So when the Cuban revolution takes place, um, there's a couple of things that the Cuban leadership does, which is really very important, and we shouldn't uh, underestimate the power of it, a lesson learned in Venezuela. One is that you have to constantly educate the pub public. You know, it's one thing for people in countries like in the West where there's, you know, much higher rates of literacy, there's more access to universities, then they can easily mock, you know, when Castro would speak for six hours, they'd mock that as a kind of the ramblings of a, of a, of a, you know, authoritarian or whatever it is. But if you're a Cuban, you don't see it like that. You see that as your university education. Uh, this is very important. You know, it's, it's, it's funny that you will mock Castro for giving a long speech, but you'll be okay for going, for spending six, eight hours going from one class to the other, getting lectures in your university. Somehow eight hours of lectures is okay in a day, but eight hours of Professor Castro giving you a full sense of world international relations, of the situation in the Cuban sugar industry, going over statistics, explaining the problems of electricity. I mean, Castro's speeches were a tour de force in conjunctural analysis. You know, he, he, if you go back and read his speeches, he was an educator of his country, a country which didn't have levels of education for uh, historic reasons, you know? And that was to, in the battle of ideas, school the people, tell the people, this is where we're at. You know what? We failed in the Cuban harvest. Castro's most amazing speeches were after defeat. Not only 1953, um, history will absolve me after Moncada, but, um, you know, when you when the 1970 sugarcane harvest speech, incredible. He goes to the people and explains why Cuba is in difficulty. And he says, I want to resign. And they say, no, you can't resign. People yell from the crowd. We don't want you to resign. When the Soviet Union collapses, he gives a series of addresses which explain what happened. And it's really very informative. And so that's one, you know, they public demonstrations and these speeches, it's not the ramblings of a megalomaniac. Or, however, you know, this there's an annoying way in which, um, you know, uh, the imperialist core is so quickly tries to delegitimize people. It doesn't see the social context, you know. And as I said, it's perfectly okay to go get, you know, go to a speech, you know, whatever in, in, in college or school. But this somehow is a bad thing. Uh, you know, no, you don't agree with what he's saying. That's the problem. It's not that you're pissed off that he's speaking for, you know, three, four, six hours. I've heard him speak. He's an incredible speaker. I would listen to him three days running. It's the best series of lectures that I've heard, you know. But the second thing they did was that around the time of Bay of Pigs, they created the committees to defend the revolution in every single hamlet around Cuba where they arm people. And, and I don't just mean militarily, they arm them organizationally. I'll give you an example of what this means. When a hurricane is tearing towards Cuba, the committee to defend the revolution has in any community, they have people who are electricians and understand electricity. They mobilize the committee, they go out there before the hurricane hits and they uh, disconnect power lines. They bring them down, okay? And they prepare and then the hurricane goes through because the hurricane is going to bring the power lines down. Once the hurricane has gone through, they get back and they reconnect. In Cuba, they lose power for the duration of the hurricane. Do you remember Puerto Rico? When the hurricane yes. came, they, because the people are not organized. 
they're disarmed. By arming the people, it never means just guns. It means you organize people. That's what true arming the people means. The difference between Cuba in a hurricane and Puerto Rico in a hurricane is the difference between socialism and capitalism. Yeah, so I, I think that you hit on something that's really key is that we have to be prepared for being armed, whether that's in the sense of guns or in terms of just organization, before we actually need to be armed. We have to be prepared for the eventuality that we will need to be armed. And one of the examples that you used um, that I want to touch on, and we mentioned it in our introduction, uh, inter- introductory segment of this uh, episode, is you mentioned the PAIGC of Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde. They were not originally a uh, armed militant struggling uh, organization, and that really only came to be an armed struggle after the Portuguese forced them to become an armed organization by massacring people in those areas. You don't know when you're going to be massacred. Uh, and of course, you know, if you can avoid a violent armed struggle, of course, you know, everybody is going to naturally say, we're going to want to avoid that. But when you're being massacred, the option for avoiding an armed struggle is no longer there. And I think that that was a really informative example that you put in the book. And, and you're giving more examples now of, you know, being armed doesn't necessarily require arms. You have to be armed for any eventuality. And a lot of these different uh, societies and systems don't allow for the arming of the citizenry. And I, I think that that's something that we really need to take out of, out of your work here is that we need to be prepared um, and people worldwide need to be prepared for every eventuality because you never know when these things are going to be coming. Do you want to comment on that before I move us on to another topic, Vijay? Well, you raised the PAIGC. This is the party in Guinea-Bissau, Cape Verde, uh, led by Amilka Cabral. There's a superb book by Sonia Vas Borges about the militant education uh, of the PAIGC. In fact, for Tricontinental, she's written a three and a half thousand word um, do- document about their militant education, which we'll bring out soon. Um, you see, because they understood, yes, they begin as a, a legal civic organization, you know, to raise people's confidence to struggle against colonialism. There's a massacre, then they have to move their armed struggle is imposed on them. Uh, this is what happens in almost every theater. In almost every national liberation situation, armed struggle is imposed. In South Africa, uh, Mandela and others, they create uh, the sword of the nation, you know, uh, because it is imposed on them. They start out with court cases and so on, and then they have to go underground and then sabotage operations, then an armed struggle um, and so on. It's imposed by power. Power never gives things up. Remember, Frederick Douglass, power concedes nothing without a demand. But now, wait a minute, uh, Frederick Douglass, this is not enough. Power never concedes enough uh, anything without a demand. But then when you demand something, they try to kill you. And so you have to defend yourself. And now the question is how? It's not always with guns. And that's it's important. I, I just want to underscore that because the PAIGC in the middle of an armed struggle, recognize the most important thing you arm people with is history, with sociology, and with an understanding of the technical capacities needed to build a society. So they taught them history. What is our history? What is our history as as opposed to their history? What they're telling us is our history. What is our real history? That's one thing. What is our sociology? What kind of society do we live in you know what are the different ethnic communities why is it that we are told we are fighting each other this is both historical and sociological you know you need to understand how sociologically people are you know and economically confronting each other and finally you have to be armed with competence you have to study agronomy you have to study you know seed science you have to study all these important things so that you can build a society in the future and that's weaponry you know Cabral comes to Havana in 1966 and gives an important address at the Tricontinental Conference called the Weapon of Theory. Um, in, in this uh, address called the Weapon of Theory, he makes this point. It's a range of things. It includes the armed struggle because they are forcing us to fight. They are coming and killing us. But it also includes education because education is weapons. It's armor for people. It helps you protect your dignity. 
if you believe, as Fanon and others have written, you know, if you believe that what the colonizer is telling you is what is real about you, you will have no dignity. You have to understand who you are to stand straight and confront the colonizer. And that's Fanon's, you know, consistent point from black skin, white mass to wretched of the earth. It's a consistent argument. If you don't have your own history, which is your real history, if you don't have, because everybody's history is dignified, you know, everybody's history is dignified. Nobody has a history that is not dignified. You know, you, you always have a history. Histories are complicated and contradictory and there's bad sides and so on. But everybody has a history with dignity in it. You pull at that seam, that pulling at that seam will strengthen your backbone. Then you will stand up for yourself. That's what arming is about. You know, the gun is a side, that's a tactic. You know, weapons are a tactic. The strategy is to stand upright. Why did Sankara take Upper Volta and change the name to Burkina Faso? Burkina Faso means the land of upright people. Great. So I, I think, I mean, you, you covered that really well. And I, what I want now is I know that the three of us, when we read your book, we came out with a lot of messages uh, and epiphanies, you could say, that you know, I think that the vast majority of the listeners won't have been exposed to. So first of all, everybody buy Washington bullets and read it. It's a very fast read. And you get a lot out of it. But um, guys, it, I guess let's bring up some of the things that we thought were really, you know, critical out of the book and maybe some questions for VJ that that are related to these epiphanies that we've had. Um, I know that one of the ones that I had was regarding the AFL-CIA, but I, I've been talking too much, so I guess let's turn it over to the guys first. And if we got time for the AFL-CIA towards the end, we'll, we'll get to that because that is something that I would like Vijay to talk about. Well, we shouldn't um, uh, go too far away from that. That was a very interesting episode. I think one of the things that was so good about the book is identifying the operations during this so-called Cold War, because it wasn't cold in the third world, as you point out, but the way in which the United States had to enlist intellectuals, artists, and cultural figures, and left uh, labor and other leftist uh, groups within the United States and to make those sorts of alliances because their real task was somehow uh, you know, to uh, convince people um, you know, not to go for the, the real option that was available right? of, of, of genuine uh, social revolution, worker control, these sorts of things. So they had to kind of adapt their message and really uh, their targets were the liberals you know, in, in a way in, in these societies. And so I think that would be very interesting to talk a little bit more about the enlisting of some of these other groups like the intellectuals, like cultural figures. Um, you talked, for for example, quite a lot about the importance of the Bandung Conference as this marking out of a new direction for post-colonial states and the um, trajectory that uh, emerges of the non-aligned movement and then the more radical dimensions of it in the tricontinental. Um, but, you know, somebody who covered this, uh, a former Marxist, you know, African-American writer of the left, Richard Wright, goes, writes The Color Curtain. He's sponsored and funded clearly by the CIA's organs for cultural dissemination of liberal, anti-communist sorts of ideas. And it's quite a shocking read when you read it. It's full of its own bigotry and, and patronizing racism and so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the way in which the kind of amnesia you're fighting against is also created by um, all of these obfuscatory intellectual and cultural enlistments uh, by power. Yeah, uh, this is a very interesting part of it because this comes straight to the question of the battle of ideas. Um, you know, from the 1940s, in fact, earlier, before the CIA was founded, during the time of the OSS and, and I mean, way back. This goes beyond U.S. history and into other, into the. Um, it was always clear that you win when you win the argument. Um, you know, you can suppress somebody, you can dominate somebody, and you can terrify them. You can rule by fear. You know, 
Machiavelli has a section on this. You know, it's better not to rule by fear, actually. It's better to rule by winning the argument, you know, uh, what the Russians called hegemony, uh, you know, which then Gramsci takes the term from Russian debates and then it enters in a very bizarre way in the American Academy. Um, you know, but the idea of hegemony was to win the argument. That that was the idea. And the CIA was adept at this. I mean, listen, these people, the bosses at the CIA, they all studied at Harvard, at Yale. You know, they know, they know history very well. Um, they often studied, you know, history or literature, things like that. Um, they understood that you had to win the argument. And they also understood that you can win the argument powerfully. You didn't have to actually win the argument. You enlist people to force the argument through. For instance, the media. Um, you call up the New York Times and you tell them that coverage is not appropriate. We want you to send this reporter to Cuba. We want you to send that reporter to Guatemala. That's it. You know, and they would, because why? They all went to Harvard and Yale together. They were friends. There was not even the need to twist anybody's arm. You know, they agreed with each other uh, at that level. Um, so, you know, we have ample evidence of these mainstream newspapers seeding reporters on behalf of the CIA. And I'm sure this happens still today. You know, I'm sure this happens now. Phone calls are made, maybe not phone calls, maybe signal messages are sent, little whispers at some club in New York City, et cetera, et cetera, it's taken care of. We know this stuff happens. So media, you know, you start getting favorable reporting in the mainstream media. Oh my Lord, you know, the Guardian, in Britain should be ashamed of saying congratulatory, you know, stories on Mars's victory in Bolivia, because last year they basically went along with the OAS. And who, you know, pays the piper calls the tune. And I don't know who pays the piper. Francis Saunders wrote a terrific book about this called who pays the piper. I've forgotten the American edition had a different name. Oh, it was called a cultural cold war. The Cultural Cold War. It's an excellent book. It's about how the CIA finances art so that, you know, um, what's his name with the throwing of paint on the canvas? Jackson um, Pollock. Jackson Pollock suddenly becomes heroic because they were trying to, you know, set aside um, not just realism, but art that was left political. And instead, you suddenly get this emergence of, you know, abstraction, uh, Rauschenberg, and, you know, this stuff, which is, let's face it, it's not unattractive. But what is it saying? I mean, you know, you smash up cars and then you spray paint them and put it in the gallery. I mean, a generation before this, Dali, I think, put a toilet bowl, or is that Marcel Duchamp put a Duchamp. toilet bowl in a gallery, you know, and said, behold, um, you know, this is, this is what the CIA funds. And Francis Saunders, she you know, demonstrates it. And then you get Lane Kirkland and the CIA. I mean, sorry, the AFL-CIO, the labor movement in the United States, which in the United States had made its compromise with uh, capitalism. This was known as business unionism. And so Kirkland led the American Federation of Labor, Congress of Industrial Unions, AFL-CIO, into basically bed with the American capitalists. And then further, even more disgraceful, into bed with the CIA and participated through these training, you know, the military, U.S. military will bring soldiers and officers from outside to train with them and basically be bribed like Manuel Noriega to go back and become agents of the CIA in their country. Um, you know, the man, uh, Williams Caliman, who walks in there and tells Evo Morales, you got to get out of Bolivia, was trained in the United States. So that's what the military does. But so does the AFL-CIO. It brought these senior trade unionists, they got big stipends, they enjoyed the flavors and fruits of American life, and then they returned home, and then suddenly you pull the chain on them and say, now you've got to do a demonstration against Chedi Jagan. And so it's a British uh, official who says, we shouldn't call them the AFL-CIO, we should call them the AFL-CIA. That is a stinging thing. I found that in the British uh, you know, uh, documents. That is a really stinging piece of British wit. Um, because, you know, do you need to say any more? And I'll tell you something, that till today, the American labor movement, Canadian labor movement, none of them have apologized for their role in the coups which have been, like, 
the American labor movement should apologize to the Guyanese people uh, for the coup against Chedi Jagan. It would be important as a gesture of solidarity. But you know why they don't apologize? Because I think they're still doing it. Yeah, so I, I think that one of the things that is really interesting here, so you, just wrapping up on the AFL-CIA, is that, of course, labor unions in the U.S. Uh, by you know liberals, left liberals, they're always seen unequivocally as positive, but they were you know, kind of incorporated into the, the CIA uh, as an apparatus for uh, usage abroad. But Brett, well, what do you want to bring up? Yeah, I, I want to continue this, this the thinking about the, the CIA and, and how its, its machinations sort of operate. Um, you talk about in the book a little bit about how these documents come out and sort of we can look back in retrospect and understand things. And, you know, part of that, you, I think you mentioned something like a wink and a nod to their own power. Like they release these documents that are, you know, showing what they're actually engaged in. But, you know, what is the motivation for releasing them at all? And and then if there is a time lapse between when they do the things and when the, the things come out, well, certainly we're probably still living in that moment now. And that's just to set up this question, which is I'm I'm often interested in that shift um, towards the use of the rhetoric of human rights, the use of the rhetoric of authoritarianism as an ideological weapon that the U.S. does against its enemies to sort of clear the way for these sorts of, of activities and really gain support of, of the Western populations for these imperial adventures. Can you talk about the ideological use of human rights and authoritarianism? Yeah, so uh, th- this language goes back to World War II, um, you know, it's this is not new language, but after the fall of the Soviet Union, it's really weaponized. Um, it's an old language. I mean, you know, you you hear it. I, I when I first read Hannah Arendt's book, Origins of Totalitarianism, mm-hmm. I was horrified by this book. You know, everybody said, "Oh, it's a great book. It's a classic. You got to read it." I was at the University of Chicago doing my PhD. Um, you know, it's this university touts itself as a place of big ideas. And this is a book with a big idea, but it's a totally big idea that's useless, <laughs> which is that communism and fascism are identical and they stand opposed to liberalism. And I read this thinking, I, as a communist, don't recognize communism in this book. Um, I don't know what she's talking about. And by the way, uh, why doesn't she talk about the fact that she thought Heidegger was a real thinker and right. not a Nazi, you know, right. who should have been shunned? Like, why isn't that part of the conversation when we think about this book and blah, blah, blah. But from that book onward, you know, we see this discourse of the free world. You know, it's this discourse of the free world that is there from after. Well, it's there during World War Two, but it really picks up in the aftermath of World War Two. There is a free world and an unfree world. And this is an exhausting and suffocating discourse. It's brilliant because what more brilliant way to um, divide the world than by saying we are on the free side and there's an unfree side. Like it's the most elegant thing. You know, you'd think, what were the Soviets doing? Why didn't they do this before? Saying we are the free world, you are the unfree. Instead, they have said we are the proletarian world in terms that don't make sense to anybody. You know, the most elegant thing is free and unfree, right? Hello, Hegel and so on, a whole tradition of thinking, freedom. And they take this elegant term and say we are free and you are unfree. And it's bizarre because we are free and yet We have Jim Crow laws in the United States, and yet Native Americans are on reservations, and yet, you know, you know, the situation for, um, you know, people of uh, Latino background and so on is appalling and abysmal, and, you know, people whose land we seized in the war against Mexico are treated as second-class citizens, even though they were there before us, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, free and unfree. And this then, after 91, this because it's so sedimented in the global consciousness that this is the free world, that these are democracies. It's so sedimented, you know. People have the. Then you can. There's no human rights problem in the West, you know. Uh-huh. And but people around the world don't believe it because every time there's a George Floyd, every time there's an Eric Garner, it makes world news. Why? Because people are like, see, mm-hmm. see, see that. This is what it really is. What it really is, they really suffocate somebody on the street. That's what it really is. But we can't say it because when we say it, we look absurd, A. And B, they cut off our aid money or they bomb us or whatever it is. So there is a way in which people actually know this is BS. 
they know that the west is not free and democratic and so on because they taste the drones and the hellfire missiles and they know what freedom is yeah but you can't state so it wins the ideological battle even though culturally there are gaps people don't believe it but they can't change the ideological battle around i think that's really where we're stuck you know why is the human rights watch going after venezuela so intensely where is the indignation when it comes to colombia or to brazil you know they the human rights watch is totally weaponized to the state department point of view yeah saudi arabia and re- and really quick Adnan, before i let you go i just wanted to mention it's also very useful using this anti-authoritarianism and human rights rhetoric to to uh, bring over liberals and left anti-communist in the imperial core because that's the sort of rhetoric and language often going back to Hannah Arendt type you know totalitarian rhetoric but that really can co-op a segment of the left at least and push them towards even full on supporting some of these imperialist actions yeah and Adnan just sorry to also butt in right before you get in I just wanted to bring up one other point that Vijay brought up in his book which of course is something that um, is fairly well known, but a lot of uh, liberals, people that would consider themselves liberals, don't really pay attention to, which is when we're labeling these countries free or unfree, one of the, the more recent classifications is that of a rogue state. And VJ brings up the dichotomy between us labeling other nations, us being the U.S., uh, labeling other nations as rogue states, whereas Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State, is completely fine with uh, more than half a million Iraqi children dying. We're not the rogue state. They're the rogue state. And this labeling really allows for basically uh, the, the security apparatus to do whatever they want without any repercussion because it's it's justified. We're doing it against the rogue state. But anyway, Adnan, I'll let you well, go Well, just, just to follow up with the continuing uh, point, I think one of the things that the book does so well, and I really appreciated, Vijay, that you were doing is that you connected that later um, hypocrisy about the free world as a discourse in post-World War II uh, U.S. imperial discourse, but how it was embedded in a longer history of the uh, colonial era and the way in which even the regimes that we think of as universalist and progressive, you know, the founding of the U.N. and the logics behind it, but even before that, the way in which um, the world was sort of carved up, um, you know, and, and international law was conceived as a regime for managing colonial and imperial competition with one another so that they wouldn't use, you know, the native had to be uncivilized because otherwise there would be the temptation by the colonial powers to use this discourse of I'm doing this on behalf of this colonial native group or that, and that would cause rivalry between, you know, the powers. So there was this kind of long history that's embedded even in the so-called universal logics and discourse and conceptions of things like international law and so on, that also was part of the contradiction you were getting at. And it was an interesting contradiction of U.S.'s sort of anti-colonial discourse and sometimes anti-colonial policy when it was confronting Britain and France during World War II to give up their colonies so that the U.S. could penetrate these markets. They had an idea you should roll back colonial control of the old colonial powers. But at the same time, it quickly and swiftly moved into, you know, retarding and stopping and suppressing anti-colonial movements in the actual third world that in a way it seemed that it came to your critique of um, the colonial context of the United States. So you didn't talk as much about the fact that it's a particular kind of colony, like the settler, col- you know, colonial context um, is very important in understanding why the United States for its elite its settler elite, you know, developed this democratic uh, ideals, liberal political philosophy, and so on. But at the same time, that could be conjoined with the policies of eradicating the indigenous people, enslaving others. And I, I thought also you could even, we talk about the Bolivarian Revolution, and it's turned into something that can be used as a progressive, you know, ideal. I know, you know, in Venezuela, they talked about it a lot. But of course, even that, were these planter class plantation that wanted to break away from Spain. And it's very similar in some ways that these Republican ideals in the era of colonialism 
used democratic language and re Republican ideals, but they were partly for this elite to better suppress and achieve their settler colonial projects. So perhaps that explains that contradiction, which I'd be interested a little bit more in you talking about, actually, that transition of the so, you know, apparently anti-colonial policies of the U.S., but then its quick you know, reconstruction of a neo-imperialist order. Yeah, it's a great question. By the way, Boliv Simon Bolivar was interesting because Bolivar starts as a Creole planter class leader and then gets defeated. And then when he is in exile, makes a pledge against slavery and then assembles an army of, you know, people of completely different backgrounds, including enslaved people. And they, when they are, vic when they are, well, almost victorious, um, He's victorious because he changes. Mm -hmm. And that's the complete, you know, Simon Bolivar is therefore the unity of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, in a way. Uh, if if uh, Washington and Lincoln were not separated by so many generations, um, this is what happens in South America. I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting story mm -hmm. because he was definitely from a position of weakness forced to uh, uh, go to the side of the masses, actually. He, he doesn't use the masses for his ends. He actually declares that I accept your demands. And that's to the credit of the people who had been enslaved in South America who actually had organized themselves and made demands. You know, uh, it's a very different kind of history. But it's, it's, he, his, the, recon, the revival of Bolivar by Chavez was a very studious revival. Mm. Um, Chavez thought hard about Bolivar, Robinson, the people around Bolivar, you know, his advisors. And there's a reason he was very keen to bring that back into the national imaginary as a way to, uh, in a way, confound uh, Venezuela with its past. You know, to say, look, Chavez was like Castro. He would give long historical speeches. He would explain to people who is, you know, Simon Bolivar, who is uh, Francisco Miranda, who is Robinson, you know, because he said, we need to go back to our history. It's not enough for us to learn U.S. history, to eat pasta, you know, to try to become American. We need to understand the Bolivarian experience. We need to understand Patria Grande. We need to understand the whole area. You know, it's it's fascinating how they mobilized history, which is where we began this, right? Mm -hmm. The United States is, is, is complicated because um, in the book, I make the argument that, in fact, the American Revolution should be understood not as an anti-colonial revolution, but as a revolution to colonize. Uh, because it's there in the material that the 13 colonies against, you know, um, the, the English yoke wanted to go outside and take the rest of the landmass. And England was busy making deals and, you know, they were not interested in pissing the French off. They had all kinds of other things going on. It wasn't that, um, you know, the king of England was insane, uh, which is, you know, oh God, you know, please, uh, Hamilton, you know, what history lesson is that for kids, man? Oh God, appalling. Terrible. It's appalling. I mean, you know, I'm all for popular history, but not this kind of crud, you know. Um, so then you can go out there and then you don't need to go overseas to colonize because you have more territory than you need. You first go all the way out, then you defeat Mexico in the war in the 1840s. You claim a third of Mexico all the way out to California. Then you can, you know, purchase uh, Alaska in a well, what at the time looked like Seward's folly, as they said, but then becomes important. You get Louisiana. And then after you've secured the territorial landmass, war with Canada was just a sideshow. You can go off and get Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, you know, Hawaii. I mean, there is no beginning of American colonialism in 1945. Uh, America begins as a colonial power. It, it's insane to, to forget this story. And, and it's insane to forget the territorial colonization. You know, well, I'm not asking people to go and read Hitler's Mein Kampf. But on the other hand, in Hitler's Mein Kampf, he has a huge section where he's saying that, look, what I want to do as the Nazi project in Europe, I want to do the Anschluss to take uh, Austria. Then I want to take the Slavic people. I'm, what I want to do is what the Americans did to the Native Americans, he writes, at length. He at length explains the genocide of the Native Americans. He said what they did was correct. We want to do the same to the Slavs. 
hello america you want to know what you did what you did was basically what the nazis were not able to do that's what's scary you know what's scary is not that you defeated the nazis but you fulfilled the nazi program generations before the nazis saw their program in your history and that's exactly what Césaire says as well. There's all of in discourse on colonialism is that this has happened in the colonies to uh, peoples around the world all the time. The reason why we're crying bloody murder about uh, Nazism is that he did it to Europe and to Europeans. That's the difference. Yeah. So uh, I know that we, we could keep VJ all day. Uh, we have a lot of things <laughs> pla planned, but we got to be respectful of VJ's time. So uh, Brett, I'll let you ask uh, if you have any final points that you want to raise to VJ since... Uh... Sure. So yeah, the way I wanted to sort of you know dive in towards the end of this conversation is to think about what we know about imperialism in the past and then perhaps project forward. One of the things that I think puts a unique spin on going forward <clears throat> is particularly the, the, the climate crisis. And um, on the liberal left in America, we hear all this talk of, of green capitalism. And I think what that will actually turn out to be in practice is more of this global north plundering of the global south, the extraction of stuff like lithium, right, to bring back and put in Tesla car batteries, for example. And it's going to have this liberal facade of being very progressive uh, here at home while it continues the same uh, project abroad. So just with what you know about imperialism, where do you see things going in the, in the near to medium term future on that front? I want to piggyback onto that, if I may. So uh, again, just Brett makes an excellent point of global north versus global south, and I just didn't want to, I wanted to raise one final point from the book before um, we we let VJ answer that question, and then we thank him. Um, one of the things that you mentioned in the book was that the Cold War, we're thinking about it wrong. We we tend to think of it as East versus West, USSR versus US, and all of these proxies, but really it's. Uh, global north versus global south powers of colonialism versus anti-colonialism um so i guess if you were if you're able to address that north versus south along with brett's point about um this eco-capitalism that we're seeing and exploitation of the global south and then then we'll thank you and and get you out of here <laughs> okay um well, that's the heart of the book, in a way, is yeah. the or the rather broad argument is the is periodization, that um, you know if you accept the periodization of the Cold War and then the post Cold War and you know the, the, this periodization comes to us from the man, um, you know they have told us that there's a post Cold War era. I, I'm not sure what they're talking about, or you know they said there was a hot era of the Cold War, then there was more detente. I mean, I don't even know what they're talking about because right through all that, if you look at the history of the world from the standpoint of, let's say, you know, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, it doesn't look like there's been much, you know, periodization necessary, you know, that we need to rethink our periodization. And, well, there certainly was a break in the early 1960s uh, from the previous history. And maybe there was a break in 1908 when, um, you know, uh, Leopold III had to essentially give up direct control of the Congo. So there's periodization within this, but it's not exactly a Cold War post. Where's the post-Cold War? It hasn't appeared in the world yet. So that's very much part of the book. And I won't say more about that because you can read up on that it's a key part of the argument in the book um well i got to say coming back to bolivia when the coup happened i wrote a series of articles uh well one of them actually noam chomsky and i wrote two days before the coup warning that there's a coup coming and people need to be out there banging the drums and you know i i called noam and said noam i got a call from you know from la paz this is serious and up in cochabamba they're afraid that they might try to kill morales and he was like okay let's do something we released a statement immediately um and then the coup happened and i was very worried that that night they were going to kill Morales. I was very, very worried about that. And in fact, he was worried. He, he skipped down, then he went off to Mexico, um, made a deal, went to Mexico, and then eventually to Argentina. But um, when that was happening, I wrote a series of articles in which I said that this is a coup against the resource socialism of the mass government. And I mentioned the lithium, but I, I actually don't 
the thing I used the phrase lithium coup, but I did say that it's lithium, it's indium. I wrote a series of things saying when uh, Bolivia is thick with these, you know, important minerals and Canadian mining companies want them, U.S. mining companies want them, and ch the Chinese were getting good deals, and there's a clash here. And that jerk Elon Musk, you know, scion of a South African apartheid family, went to a private all-white school. Elon Musk wants his, you know, his tentacles are going to go, and then I wrote all this stuff. I admit it, okay? Then I got attacked from people saying you're a conspiracy theorist, that this is nothing to do with, and continue. Somebody wrote something recently, and I was sent that, oh, he's a he and Morales, myself and Morales, concocted this uh, false story that it's a lithium coup. Okay, this this went around and I was thinking, seriously? Okay, fine. I don't care. I don't have to answer you. This is what I believe. I think they're there for the minerals because here's what's happening. Is you're talking about a Green New Deal, which is going to rely, it certainly may transition away from fossil fuels, but it's going to rely because you don't have battery capacity in any other way than using things like cobalt, lithium, and so on, because solar, because, um, you know, uh, even water, you know, uh, uh, hydropower, wind power needs batteries because you it's irregular power. Unlike fossil fuels, you need batteries. The best battery agents we have are these. And when you're talking cobalt, you're talking about copper tailings and so on in in the Congo, and those are highly exploited miners, often children and so on. Terrible situation. Um, the biggest company there is a former U.S. company now domiciled in Switzerland called Glencore. Um, you know, big in the in the in the co uh, the cobalt mining, and then lithium. You know, which is Argentina, Bolivia, and um, and 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 uh, Chile. Now, it's true that there's a lot of lithium is mined in Australia and so on, but this is where the bulk of it is, and. If green is going to explode, this was the future. This is the money lithium. There's lithium in Cornwall, by the way, in the UK. But I don't think they're going to allow that to be majorly mined because it's so beautiful and, you know, not in my backyard. You'll screw up the great salt flats of, of Chile and so on. You're not going to screw up Cornwall. And Australia is basically what is being used now. When the expansion happens, it's Chile, Bolivia, Argentina. And... This is of concern to me that, you know, liberals and so on in the West touting the new, Green New Deal. It's not that the Bolivians don't want to export the lithium. And, you know, I know there's a radical environmentalist section that says, you know, Morales didn't tend. How, you know. Listen, the Bolivians had the best climate uh, argument about 10 years ago. They released a global plan on climate. Nobody takes that seriously. In fact, I was talking to Nick Estes, you know, of the Red Nation, and he was saying the conversation around climate shouldn't begin with the Green New Deal as if it's been invented in Europe or the United States. It should begin in Bolivia, where they've been talking about this Pachamama, you know, a good life and so on for the last couple of decades. Uh, but you're still attacking Morales, saying he's anti-environmental, when your great environmental project is going to rely essentially on the destruction of indigenous communities around the world. I mean, what the hell is this? You know, you're weaponizing environmentalism. Pablo Solon, a former minister in Morales government, is really the key person here. You're weaponizing environmentalism to attack Morales, who is one of the world's leaders on the issue of the environment. That doesn't mean his government doesn't do things like build a road in the Amazon. Because, you know, there are contradictions in the world, okay? I mean, I'm not embarrassed to say it, okay? Nobody can live perfectly. You know, you're sitting inside an area where you've clear-cut the whole forest, you're working on a high-speed computer, you're driving to Walmart to buy your shit, and you're accused of saying they shouldn't have a road through the Amazon. I mean, what the hell, man? Let's have some, you know, basic decency when we have these discussions, you know? You're flying all over the world uh, at environmental conferences attacking Morales. I mean... Good God, man, this is the one indigenous leader who was standing up at the UN and saying we need to do something much more than the Paris Agreement, and you're piling on to him. I mean, disgraceful, frankly, to your shame. I think that that speaks to a larger uh, narrative against indigenous uh, peoples by Westerners, particularly. Uh, I've seen a lot of Westerners talk about, you know, how indigenous leaders or indigenous groups have not been environmentalists. Okay, well, let's have a little perspective here. But uh, again, there's so much more that we could say 
uh, Vijay Prashad. That was uh, incredible. So I, I just want to pitch to everyone that's listening. Uh, check out the Tricontinental Institute. I just got their newest newsletter today. Um, and it, it's stuff that you're not going to see anywhere else. I, I'll just quote the very beginning of it. Uh, from the 43rd newsletter from the Tricontinental. Any day now, Zambia will be the first African country to fall into a private debt default. And you talk about the IMF. And of course, the IMS, IMF plays a prominent role in Washington bullets. But where else are you going to hear about Zambia falling into private debt default? So the work that you're doing at Tricontinental is really invaluable. And Everybody should go go to the Tricontinental and sign up for the newsletter. But Vijay Prashad, director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social uh, Research and author of the new book, Washington Bullets, Out from Leftward Books. How can our listeners find you and what are you working on now, now that you've finished this book? Well, firstly, the Tricontinental is an incredible team uh, of over 30 people based in many countries. And we are... Uh, backed and supported by uh, political and social movements that are our heart and soul. So anything you read any in any of our work, uh, it it comes from our movements. It's they have theorized us to where we are, and and I'm not just saying that. I'm I'm actually telling you the truth. This is exactly how it works. Um, people should go and and look at the material. You know, we have a dossier coming out next month, which is on the impact of Paulo Freire on uh, South African liberation struggles. And where our team interviewed people in the South African liberation movement to talk about the impact of of pedagogy of the oppressed, but also to uh, learn from our Brazilian comrades about the impact of the South African liberation struggle on pedagogy of the oppressed. Uh, It's a really interesting story and, and they've done a terrific three and a half thousand word dossier on it uh, with lovely illustrations and and so on so yeah please by all means i I agree with you go and look at the website um i'm working on a book now about uh well i have a book coming out in a couple of weeks actually edited book called vivi ramos um venezuela versus hybrid war and it'll be out from leftward but also international publishers in new york and it's edited along with Manola de los Santos and Claudia de la Cruz. And it has a preface from Carlos Ron, who is the director of the Simon Bolivar Institute in Caracas. It's a great volume. You know, it, it, it takes the piss out of the sanctions, the whole sanctions thing. It has a speech by Samuel Moncada, who's the Venezuelan permanent representative to the UN. Um, essays from, you know, a range of, of people, Belen Fernandez, you know, terrific writer, uh, Anya Parampal, who's with the Grey Zone, um, you know, it's got terrific essays. Some of them are funny, even though it's a really difficult issue we're dealing with here. Um, uh, you know, so I, I recommend it. it's called Vivi Ramos, which, you know, if you remember Chavez took the Cuban slogan, Venceremos, we will overcome. And he he added to it, it was Viviremos y Venceremos, you know, we will live and we will overcome. And so we call the book Viviremos. Uh, and the subtitle is, you know, it's 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 basically classic um, cage wrestling, Venezuela versus hybrid war. Great. Well, we'll probably try to bring you back after uh, that's released to talk about that. But uh, Vijay, you have an excellent Twitter page. Tell our listeners how to follow you on Twitter. I think it's just my name. Uh, it's at Vijay Prashad, I think. And it's basically a great way to blow off steam. And, um, you know, uh, nobody should be, nobody should live their life attempting to always be serious in every way. Um, intellectuals particularly should not pretend that they smoke a pipe and wear a, a blazer and have an air of superiority and seriousness. And what I love about Twitter is that Twitter gives me the opportunity to be a human being and just have fun and and playful and and say things that are on my mind and then just go away. And uh, I think intellectual activity, you know, we just need to take the air out of that balloon. Uh, There's just a lot of pompousness and, and, you know, superiority and, I mean, you're smart and you read a lot of books, but you don't have to keep laying that on people, you know, relax, like <laughs> smile and, and, you know, aren't you an idiot sometimes in the day? Don't you like music? I mean, you're a human being. And 
I think that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Well, I think we've had a lot of fun in this conversation too. So we really, really appreciate not only your knowledge, but also your generosity in sharing it and the uh, conversational way and in, in fun way in which we've been able to engage with you. Yeah. Thanks, Vijay. Thanks for coming. And uh, we'll be right back with more on Gorilla History. Man, that was quite the interview that we had there with VJ. Uh, what did you guys think about it? Brett, I guess we'll start with you. What did you think about our interview with VJ? Yeah, I mean, well, first and foremost, you know, VJ is an incredibly personable human being. And so there's a little nervousness when you have somebody as big as VJ come on a show, especially when you're just trying to find out who you are as a show. And so to have him have that just very welcoming, open, laughing personality uh, was wonderful and put us all at ease, I think. But something he said in the beginning, I think, is, is worth uh, you know, re-entrenching sort of. And that's this idea of, of good people and, and equipping good people with the knowledge they need to try to make the world a better place. And, and very often, whether we talk about political theory or we do academic discussions of history or even some strains of the Marxist left, there's this sort of pushing away of the subjective of, of morality as, as you know, superstructural phenomena that we don't need to place too much focus on. But I think at the end of the day, a lot of people are truly inspired because of their humanity. Um, they're truly inspired by this burning sense of love and compassion for other human beings. And so to play that up and to talk and to appeal to people's better natures and to, to try to appeal to their humanity, I think, is, a, is an important part of, of everything that we're doing. And it should not uh, be dismissed. He talked about the, the dignity in, in people's histories and how certain figures can help bring that out. And I certainly, you know, we, we in our intro, we have Malcolm X talking. And one of his great contributions to black radicalism in the U.S. was precisely this like this love yourself. He has these speeches where he talks about, you know, love the way that you look. Everything that the white man tries to tell you is ugly or lesser than about you. Embrace it and turn that into something that you find beautiful about yourself. And that expression of self-love then, I think, transformed through the Black Panther Party and into hip-hop itself, um, which I think is a fascinating sort of trajectory that you can trace stemming out of Malcolm X and, of course, before him with you know, people like Du Bois and Frederick Douglass, etc. But I think that's an incredibly important thing, and that's something that France Fanon and of the earth um, did as well, you know, thinking about the human psyche and and the human fight for dignity and standing up on your own t two feet and looking your oppressor in the eye and how that's a dignifying process. And then the, the other thing that stuck out to me was when he talks about arming the people in places like Cuba and Bolivia and Venezuela, he's like, guns are one part of it. But the other two parts of it are education and organization. So when we talk about these these movements arming the people, arming them with knowledge, arming them with organizational capacity, and then or, or uh, arming them with actual weaponry to defend the revolution. And I think that's a very crucial thing, particularly in some segments of the Western left, where I think there can be this fetishization of, of violence and, and this sort of abstract revolutionaryism, but without these other components really taken seriously. So I, I just really appreciated that about him. Yeah, and I'm just going to draw the interconnection between these shows again. Brett, you had an excellent uh, episode on Red Menace with your co-host, Allison Escalante, on Wretched of the Earth. So for listeners who want to become more familiar with that work, uh, definitely check out that episode on the Red Menace podcast. Adna, what did you think of our conversation with VJ? Well, I think it was a perfect inaugural episode because it really... In two ways, it really covered a uh, wide-ranging terrain that I hope we'll be able to follow up with some more specific uh, uh, episodes, but he gave such a, a wonderful, uh, synthetic, overarching um, sense of the terrain of history that we're interested in for contemporary struggles. And two, um, his approach is so compatible with the purpose behind this podcast. I mean, he has been doing essentially a kind of guerrilla history. And one thing that really I appreciated very much is how he said that the audience for his work really was young activists to be able to crystallize some key understanding and to arm them with the kind of knowledge that they need about the way in which the uh, CIA's imperialist uh, uh, 
program for regime change is actually a playbook that has a, a historical pattern. And when you're immersed in one particular context, you may not see it. So being armed with this knowledge really helps prepare people for how to respond to it, how to recognize it. Um, and so I think that was uh, something that was very important uh, to come out of the conversation and come out of his uh, out of his work. So I think in some ways um, uh, he's sort of the uh, ideal figure to uh, talk about history for contemporary struggles. Like there doesn't need to be a lot of analysis from us to take uh, a discussion of history and figure out how it can be useful. That's what his whole work, his body of work is about. And certainly this book, Washington Bullets, does that. Yeah, so... Uh, I guess I'll give my thoughts on the conversation before I pitch it back to you guys for just any final thoughts on Washington Bullets as a, as a book or how it integrates with the conversation that we had. But what I want to say is that this conversation was really important because VJ brought up something in the conversation I didn't think came out in the book. Uh, it didn't come out in the book particularly, which the book was quite almost fatalistic in a way. Um, which is something that we see pretty frequently. There's, there's very, very seldom this middle ground that we are able to tread. You either have people that are naive as to how difficult it actually is to affect meaningful change in a society because they're unaware or uh, just ignorant as to the sort of forces that are pushing back against them. And, uh, you know, whether that's within the, uh, within the United States or outside of the United States, a lot of these people don't necessarily think of how the CIA are, are pushing against them both, birth, both uh, overtly as well as covertly, how the IM, INF is, uh, IMF is pushing against them, how NGOs have infiltrated them. And that was something that we didn't get to talk about in the interview is the infiltration of NGOs in Haiti, which I think is something that a lot of people don't think about as a way of controlling uh, a populace as well as as well as policy within that area but alas that's something that's happening um so you either have people that are ignorant as to quite how difficult it is to affect change within their personal lives as well as societally and then on the other hand you have people who uh maybe are informed about it maybe they've read the washington bullets you know who knows they but they're aware of all of these external forces on them and they become fatalistic in a way they come to think you know is it really worth the struggle because we have all of these external forces pushing against us there's no way that we can really overcome that but the conversation with vj both by talking about the information about these external forces that are pressing against you so that we're not ignorant but getting that hope that brett you brought up uh, at the beginning of the conversation adnan you talked about earlier getting this hope that Yes, it's difficult. We have to understand that it is difficult. We have to understand why it's difficult. But by having that knowledge, we can then have the hope that we actually will change things because we have examples of where good people make change. And as we said, um, it's just a few days before we recorded this. I don't know uh, how it'll come out temporally based on when this episode actually drops. But um, the election of Moss back in Bolivia is an example and VJ used it as a very fitting example of how good people can affect change and that should give us hope despite the forces that we have pressing against us so do either of you have any uh, other final thoughts that we want to conclude with before we wrap this up uh, sh sure yeah quickly my final thoughts and just you know harping on that idea of optimism and hope which brings us back to, to sort of dialectics. And it's not some abstract in the clouds thing. It's, it's a very real thing. And one of the things that dialectics tells us is wherever there is repression, wherever there is occupation, domination, exploitation, there's also simultaneously the seeds of the rebellion against that state of affairs. And as things get worse, as fascism becomes more resurgent, as climate change bears down on us, as all these contradictions become increasingly harder and harder to buffer by ideology and ignore, I, I do believe there are enough good people in this world um, that will c continue to wake up and to rise up. And I don't know exactly how that will happen. I don't know exactly how all those things will play out, how organized things will be. But there is that that 
that level of resistance and it's always going to be there and it upticks with the uptick of repression and domination. And if nothing else from all of this history, wherever there's been imperialist domination and bloodshed and slaughter, as tragic and as horrifying as that history is, there is also always people fighting back, always good people willing to even sacrifice their own life to make things better for others. And that's the tradition that we stand in. And that can give us not only the dignity of our history, as VJ would put it, but also a vision for how we can move forward and continue to do our work in a vein that is optimistic. You know, as Gramsci said, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. And that's the, that's the middle way, I think, we're, we're, that you're getting at, Henry. Yeah, exactly. Adnan, final word? Uh, just I would echo that I think what I really appreciated uh, since reading it, it was a disturbing uh, retailing of all the ways in which U.S. empire has derailed progressive leftist movements, people's movements, that he did really have an analysis that should be encouraging because he's arming us with tools from history um, in our plans to win. And that is indeed, it's not just about the struggle, but it's about effective um, engagement. It's about effective struggle with the goal and the objective to create a better society. That's what we're after. And I think this history really helped us see um, some of the ways in which we can be prepared uh, to achieve that purpose. Yeah, excellent. So Adnan, Brett, thanks for... uh coming in and, and sharing this conversation with me. It was uh, a lot of fun, really informative. Uh, Brett, how can our listeners follow you on social media? On social media, you can just go to at Rev Left Radio, um, and uh, that's on Twitter. And under the Twitter, there's a link to our website if you can find our Patreon, our sister podcast, uh, etc. And everybody should go and listen to Rev Left Radio and Red Menace uh, and donate to those shows' Patreon pages. They're really incredible resources for for thought on the left adnan how can our listeners find you uh they can find me on twitter uh at adnan a hussein one s all one word and um if you're also interested in the middle east islamic world uh i also have a podcast called the mudgeless podcast which is uh um sponsored by the muslim society's global perspectives project i direct at queen's university Excellent. And as for me, you can follow me on Twitter at Huck1995, and you can join me on Patreon. I write about public health and science primarily, uh, patreon.com forward slash Huck1995. Thanks a lot, guys. Looking forward to our next conversation. Solidarity with both of you and solidarity with the listeners.